Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. Good evening, friends, family, those in Christ, and everyone else that may see this video, how are you? First, I'd like to open up by offering my prayers and sending prayers definitely to Israel, the motherland of uh, the people of Israel, the pain that they're going through, and especially India, which are being, is being ravaged by COVID-19 and the variant that is uh, destroying them. It is, uh, it is painful to know these things are true and existing, but it's, it, is a, it is a byproduct of what sin is. Uh, today is very informal. I really don't have some said script, and I never really have a said script. I don't think that anything that uh, comes, from, comes from God is always going to come from these well-prepared, well-mannered, and uh, 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 convincing words as you hear so many do uh, say today. I'm not saying that those things aren't bad. You can script whatever you want, but um, I, I don't have persuasive words and I don't think that it ever should be something I should ever give to you um, to try to sway your opinion or sway your thinking one way or another. It's either you will believe in God or you won't. Cause I, Sharon Eric Miller doesn't do anything for anybody. It, My thoughts and my uh, what I believe in a sense of uh, in, the, in regards to opinions don't matter but what God says about himself because it comes from the Bible does matter now with that being said that goes into where we're at today on this Sunday as we start our new week it, it was good for me to uh, to get online to just kind of just give you an overview of what has been happening ever since I've been freed from human religion. Because at the end of the day, human religion is nothing more than just the golden calf dressed up to look and appear godly, but it is not. The Bible tells us this. And it forever has been telling us this. Because God has been forever telling us this. Today, I got to reflect on Roman Catholicism, religion as a whole, Reformed theology, which I know is, is and when I say this, I, I mean this with all surety, is a parasite to the Christian body. It is a tapeworm that ravages and kills the spirit of a believer. It allows goats to mingle with sheep to where it's so hard to tell the two from each other that you won't even see the wolf consuming your brothers and sisters. This happens every day. It happens every day. It is tragic to know that we can't even speak out against any religion without someone coming out swinging for the fences to defend it. And that in itself is what makes religion much like a cockroach. It's resilient. It knows how to survive because sin knows how to survive. Sin knows how to reproduce. It knows how to replicate. It knows how to survive. It has survived all from Adam to this day. It is the most perfect, designed, murderous machine. It is a predator beyond anything on that you've ever conceived in your mind. So much so 
that it ravaged and took and killed the devil. I want you to think about that for a second. It even killed him. It perverted him. Sin, its origin, is the disobedience against God. These are the plain facts of sin. This is what it is. It is against God and God alone. There is no other, there is no if, if ands, or buts. There's no maybes. There's no, um, well, it could be this, it could be that. All that's in the wind. It's exactly that. It is sin against Almighty God. And this week, there has been a prevailing theme, or last week, has been a prevailing theme of when I engage those in religion, mind you, of how, and it shows how sin works. It shows just how sin truly perverts the mind, the thoughts, and unfortunately the beliefs of those that it consumes. Sin would not be sin if it did not have a convincing argument. Sin would not be sin if it didn't thoroughly kill the spirit. And why did I start this by saying reform theology? Because there's nothing worse than a thinking that tries to exalt itself against Almighty God. And nothing preys on the human spirit than misery. And the core belief of all evil comes in man's thinking that they know who God is. They don't. Men have tried this from day one and it's never worked. What started this whole um, me coming on tonight was a conversation with a young man. And it wasn't him. It, he was kind of like the catalyst that really just sparked me to go, man, I got to address this because I've been addressing this on my podcast. It's been through my uh, I'm not going to plug my podcast here. That's not what it's here for today. So I'll, I will tell you about it later. But it came from the, a conversation where I posted something and we were having a discussion. It was, it was a small discussion. A young man had stated, well, God gives us options. And that just, oh, that just, it took me back. That's what really brought this to here today. And you got to ask, well, what does Reformed theology have to do with it? It has everything to do with it, trust me. Reformed theology preys on the Christian more than it does anything else. It's not looking for souls out in the world. No, no, no. Reformed theology doesn't look for souls outside. There's no gospel for them to give outside. There's nothing for them to go to the outside world with. When in Matthew 28, 19 through, uh, 20, 28, 19 to 20, Jesus said, go make disciples of all the nations. Reformed theology says we got to make believers out of the believers. They prey on us, especially in our weakened state. That's what they do. And that's what now religion preys on the outside world. Religion, it preys, it's, it, it's food, it's meal, it's target audience. It's everyone else out there in the world. That's why religion can be anything anyone comes up with. And, and religion basically is a set of beliefs in ritualism, traditions. And you can attach that to anything. It's said beliefs and it comes from a man, comes from a woman, it comes from a human being. And all it takes is adherence, people to say, you know, that kind of makes sense. And then we roll with it. It's all it takes. Religion comes from men, preys on men, because it says, I have something that you've been missing. 
I have something that you've been missing. Now, every human on this earth has the fear of missing out. Everyone's been built with FOMO into their system. That's why we have anxiety today. That's what drives our economy or every economy. It's what drives marriages apart. It's what drives people to keep looking for the next cell phone, the next this, the next that. It's always the focus of what we don't have and that shiny thing of that's in front of us that, man, if I don't have that, I won't get it. I, I won't, I'll, I'll be missing out on that joy. Sin always, sin will always, without a shadow of a doubt, keep you looking for something to improve your life. Sin has one goal, destruction. It has an endless appetite. It, you can't reason with it. You can't placate it. You can't indulge it thinking that if I just give in a little, it'll lean off me. You, it, it's bottomless. It is a predator without negotiation. It doesn't rest. It does not have an exhaustion button. It doesn't get tired. And it never loses until Jesus Christ. Never lost. It's never lost. It 100% does in each person what it sets out to do. Condemn to hell. Does it without... And actually, let's be honest. To, to, to be straight honest with that, on the, all sin does is kill. That's what it really does. What condemns us to hell are the consequences for our choices to continue to refuse God. That's the consequences of the action. So that goes back to, does God give options? And with that, does God give options comes the most obvious question it is, if God gives options, did he know sin was coming and did he allow it? See, this is where Reformed theology does its greatest lies and its greatest hat tricks. Because you have to understand, when a, when a religion says that they know God, they now have to define the one thing that God hates more than anything else. But they use sin and play the hat tricks. Okay? Anybody that knows Reformed theology knows that at the end of the day, God is the is is fully aware, fully cognizant, fully sovereign. So even though he's not the architect of evil, it still goes back to him. Now you can find any any theologian out there that loves reformed theology, and they'll all have the same truths they'll come out with. They'll spin it, but at the end of the day, it all falls on God. And they will say, "Well, if it can," and then they will use the Bible to do so. You know they'll use they'll use the Old Testament, and they'll they'll use that only, and only and only the King James version only to justify the way they think. So, because that's one of the few times Reformed theology will go to the Old Testament. Because let's be honest, they won't go to the Old Testament for anything else. Trust me on that one. So, does God? Did he know the sin was there? Did he permit it? Did he allow it? Was that something that he's fine with? And if he's all good those things, and it doesn't corrupt God at all to know that he created evil in itself. You have to understand the main argument to reform theology is, is God not sovereign? Sovereignty, that if God's not sovereign, God's sovereignty has never been in question. Matter of fact, at the end of the day, to understand reform theology even better, they're the only ones that has to begin the conversation with, is God not sovereign? That's not ever a question because a human being can't challenge God's sovereignty. That's the first thing we can understand. And that's the first thing that, should, that every human being on this earth gets at a fundamental level of who they are. They know you have scientists that have gone out of their way with theories 
to try their best to tell this is where life came from. This is how life evolved. This is everyone tries. God's sovereignty is never in question. Never, never could be, never can be. And the fact that they argue from that point is how they try to steer the narrative. Because if you control the narrative, you control the outcome. You know who's been doing that since day one? Well, not day one, but we can see that with the devil himself. That's what I was going to. As you saw my eyes look down, we're going to the Bible. Because without the Bible, we this whole conversation means nothing. We've got to go to the handy, beautiful word of the Lord. Because with him, everything is beautiful. So let's now examine the beautiful word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, indeed. Let's examine that for a second. Indeed. Yeah, I understand. Okay. I, a path, a path. I understand. I get it. Indeed, God has said. So think about this. Satan is confirming. Satan is confirming. Okay. Look, I, I, okay, I get that God said. I get it. He's actually starting this conversation as if Eve was already questioning something, and she wasn't. That's what reform theology does. That's what that's what theology does. That's what religion does. It starts a conversation before you've even asked. And that's controlling the narrative. He started the situation by controlling the narrative by already assuming to, to he's basically making the assumption to her to Eve that there's a conversation that's been had or he's saying, hey, look, Eve, I get that you heard this. It's amazing how Satan works. It's amazing how people try to think they can be out thought of. They think they can, we can figure Satan out. We think we can reason with him. We think we can contest against him. You got people saying, oh, just, you know, if Satan comes knocking at the door, you can rebuke the, if Satan comes knocking at your door, you better send Jesus. Because if you don't, you're going to have this same conversation that Eve's having. So listen to this. And the woman said to the, listen to this. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said you shall not eat it from or touch it or you will die. Now, here's the amazing part of this conversation. Eve bought into the narrative. Isn't that amazing? Satan started out with, indeed, did God say? And she said, well, he did say. Control the narrative. You control the conversation. That's how religion works. That's how reformed theology works. That's how all evil things work. Control the narrative. You control everything. Now listen to this. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now there's the fear of missing out. The one thing that, that drives humanity to the grave. The fear of missing out. The trigger of emotion. You have to understand how emotions work are triggered you got to have a foundation of something that it the fear of losing it or experiencing it is there okay got to be there you will be like god eve if you just eat that fruit god knows that if you eat it You'll be like him. You'll know good and evil. 
you will know what God knows. God knows this. And you, you're not going to die because with this knowledge comes power. You will not die. You can't. Look, God said that, but he's not going to do it. Because he's not going to. You're not going to die if you eat it. He transformed and switched the narrative to where it went from being a command to now it's an option. See, again, all it started with God doesn't give options. He gives commands. There is no option in that. He didn't say either you do it. And then you have this over here that you can do. And maybe that over there. And then leave it be. God tells you what you must do. And you will do it. And at this point in the relationship with God in, 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 in Genesis chapter 2. At this point, Adam completely acted in his own free will. And chose to do what? follow because it didn't even enter his mind anything else that's the nature of it that is how powerful and beautiful that makes Christ Christ had many options Christ had so many options out there he had tons of them but every time you asked him what did he do I didn't come to do the will of me I didn't come to do me I came to do the will of my father. There was nothing else for him to do. There was nothing else that he could make a decision on. There was no other reason he existed to this point, to us in this flesh, but to carry out the will of God. And matter of fact, just so we can all know, Paul reiterates that is what we're doing our study in right now. Philippians we go to Philippians chapter chapter 2. Let's listen to this. Love this part. This is talking about this is talking about those options we like to discuss. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't take options. Did he not? You hear, look, look, look my opinion doesn't matter. See, that's the thing how evil people work. I'm going to tell you how twisted sinners work. And this is the same mindset we all have. I ain't excluded. You can try to control the narrative. You can get anybody to go anywhere you want. You stick to the word of the Lord. You create enemies. You create problems. It, that's what happens. That's the nature of sinners. That's why you never, ever go on the side of those that are trying to control the narrative. You never go. Let's go ahead and continue because you know, it ain't enough that I tell you. You got to see it for yourself because at the end of the day, when I get off this thing, you still got to deal with your own mind. You got to deal with your own spirit. You got to deal with God on your, on the level that you got to deal with him. So I, I, I'm just here for a small amount of time, but you got to deal with that. So let's go ahead and go into the Bible and let's go to let's let's use our our favorite let's my favorite the CSB love the CSB. Let's go ahead and go to a very famous verse. Let's go to Matthew chapter four. I think that's a perfect place to go. Let's go to Matthew chapter four, and we're going to show you again. Satan offered the same thing to Christ as he did Eve. He tried to give him options. That's a favorite thing. I'm telling you. Options have created denominations. Options have created every offspring 
of human belief out there to where we now live in a time where it says, well, that's my truth. And whatever your truth is true to you and what truth to me is true to me. And the Bible cannot be involved because guess what? That that truth is always, always the same. It can't be changed. There's no options on the Bible. Either you believe it or you don't. You can't believe it in partial because that's not believing the Bible. Either you believe it or you don't. That's it. That, that's all there is. But much like Satan did, he gets you to think, well, guess what? You're thinking, guess what? You, you can read the Bible and, and interpret it just as good, if not better than someone else. Go ahead and believe, put your beliefs and overlay them over the Bible and now go out and tell people what you think about what's going on. Because remember, God, you, you know good and evil now. There's no excuse. You got power that Satan promised. You now know good and evil. You can now do the very things like God. You know what must be done. Every religion is based on a man saying, I know this is right. Every religion, every belief structure or lack thereof, even the atheist will say the same thing a religious man will say, I know I'm right. It's how it works. Because that man has options. He does. Because sin opens the door for every option out there. Because there's no limit. Everybody can create whatever you want. On TikTok right now, there's, you know, Christianity... Uh, the Christian post on there is like one door, uh, like one tag is like 1.3 billion, right? You know, if, if you look on TikTok, you want to know what is in like the 15.4 billion. Yeah, I'm talking about like 7 billion. You know what is, you know what, what those tags are? Manifestation. You can create your reality. You can create your reality. Think about that for a second. It's outnumbering Christian truth. Witchcraft is outnumbering Christian truth. That's options. There are witches right now that follow me, that, that subscribe to my podcast, that listen, and every day and every week they're listening and I get email. They are they say we are Christians. Can't make this up. Well, we just believe this as well. They got options. They got options. Well, let's see what Christ, how Christ acted on options. Let's go to Matthew 4, like I said. Because this is where Jesus was tempted. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What do you think he was being tempted with? Options. Of course. Because he knew no sin. He was born without it. Which means he had to act outside of God's will. He had to do what Adam was commanded. He has to do what Adam was commanded to do. Which is what? Obey. He had to obey. And Satan, his job is to say, well, well, hold on now. There's options, baby. You can still obey, but now you can do this as well. There's got to be some room. Listen to this. Here's Satan. And the tempter came and said to him, verse 3, If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Think about that. Flex your might. Look, do it. Command these. Look, turn them right there. To look, that's look. You can do it. That does not change your role at the, at, of what you are to be the savior. That does not change what you're gonna do as 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 the as the God man. You still can do all the things that's coming. But just do this. Prove to me. Show me. Show. Flex that spiritual might. What does Jesus say? It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
Did Jesus have an option? Hmm. Hmm. Not that, not in his mind. Even at his weakened state, he knew what? I'm relying on the truth of God. How do we know that? Remember, it ain't good to just hear me read something and then, uh, and then I answer with that. No, no. Let's let Paul continue from Philippians. Chapter 2. Listen to this because we finished. Listen to this. Had the same attitude in yourselves which was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with, with, with God a thing to be grasped, the very thing that Satan offered him. Just as God commanded, he said, look, now he knew Jesus was God. Don't let nobody tell you different. If you are, he said, command those stones. He didn't say, make them. He didn't say, alter him. He didn't say snap a finger. He said, command that stone to become bread. Satan knew who he was without a shadow of a doubt. And what did Jesus do? Did not regard being God as something to be grasped. He didn't have an option. He didn't take the option. He didn't take the bait. And we know more because listen to this. Although he existed in the form of God. Who's, so he was God. He existed in the form of God. But what did he do? He emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Did God not create Adam from dust? Sure did. So here's here's Jesus Christ. Now formed just like man. Just like Adam was given a command, God gave his son the word of the Lord. He gave Jesus Christ a command. You will do this thing and this thing only. And Christ did what Adam did not. He didn't see options because the options are where sin lie. Jesus saw what? The will of the Father. All that mattered to him. How do we know that? Because he was being made in the likeness of men. In verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. By the by humbling himself, by becoming what? He was in the appearance of a man, likeness of men, humbled himself, and became obedient. The thing Adam did not do. See, obedience obliterates anything outside of it. There's no options. In obedience, there is you do it, or consequence. And the consequence, it, it's black and white. See, black and white. Let me tell you where options get us. Let me give you a broad understanding of what options is. You, everybody shopped in a, um, everyone, everyone shops in a, in a department store, grocery store, you name it, right? How many forms of ketchup is it? Okay, let's let's go with a uh, soda water or pop or however you like to say it. How many forms of that? Let's go with sinus relief. How many forms of sinus tablets are out there? Let's go with cold medicine. How many cold medicines are out there? Let's go with car selection. How many cars are out there? The who's the right carrier? Is it AT and T? Is it Verizon? What the right cell phone is it? Is it uh, is it Apple? Is it going to be Samsung? Is going to be whose pancakes are the best? Options are everywhere, and you know the one thing that with options comes one truth that no one likes to talk about. Which one's right? Which one of those is true? Well, then the options now have to go down to the person. 
Now the person has to make a decision on what's right for them. So now they're exercising that option and they're saying, well, I like Heinz because it just tastes better to me. Now you got somebody over there says, well, I like Willie Jones as a, a special ketchup because this tastes right for me. Who's right? Which ketchup is the best? Which one has the best ingredients? Which one? I mean, you can put you now we can go. I'm, and I'm not trying to trivialize this, but it really is. This, this is religion as a whole. This is what options give you. This all sparked from Satan saying what? Indeed, God gave you a command, but hey, he knows that he gave you that command, but you gotta, you don't have to necessarily listen. Hey, you're not going to die if you make a different choice. You don't, he, you're not. If anything, you want to understand the one thing that Satan de definitely gave us that, that human beings use every day? Theology. Personal belief. He gave us personal belief. He gave us the ability to say if one guy buys Heinz and 30 guys buy Heinz and 50 buy Heinz and the company buys in those spots at the Super Bowl and the commercials and they get your celebrity to endorse it. And now Heinz 57 is now merging with Apple because now you, you can find you can reorder Heinz by pushing an app. And now all of a sudden you got influence. And now people can say, well, I, you know, and now with that comes also the what? The intellectuals. And, and I'm just using this as an example. But they, you got intellectuals now that can argue the point of, well, you know, Heinz technically made the actual formula. So if there's anybody that knows how to make it, it would be them. And they use the original ingredients and they own the original fields that, and they can scientifically give you all the benefits of it. But are they right? Well, what are they what are they what are they basing all this information on? Options. Information that 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 can what reiterate and reinforce their belief, thinking that you know what, they're impassioned. They believe that this is right. They 100% believe that this is the truth. And from that comes the next phase of the sin, bigotry. And bigotry is not against skin. Let's be, it's that, that is the the famous easy way to go. Oh, he's a bigot and he did that the third. Look, I tell you right now, bigotry, you know, you want to talk about um, skin relations. You want to talk about anything like that. Let me tell you, the weakest, most mentally fragile person you'll ever meet in your life is the bigot. The one that regards skin and flesh as important. You run across that individual you run across someone that is so mentally fragile, they fall for so many, the most ignorant schemes out there, these fools will fall for it. Because you gotta remember, that's the basis, that's the basis of all evil comes from is, I, my skin is superior. Well, but it also goes back down to exactly also of, what, their beliefs. Their beliefs. Their beliefs is that they believe 100% that they're right they believe that they are correct on everything listen to this listen to this this is bigotry obstinate or unreasonable attachment to a belief opinion or faction wow now if you want to drill into it more in particular it is a prejudice against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular group. Bigotry does not mean just skin. Bigotry comes in the form of who your family is, what church you belong to, what 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 political party you reside with and stand with, what country you live in. How many people you heard like America is the best country in the world? And you go to China, they say my country's best in the world. You're Russia, my country, and they truly believe all. You will not convince them otherwise. I believe all black people are stupid. I believe all white people are stupid. I, you name it. Guess what? Does religion not? It religion is obstinate and an unreasonable attachment 
to believe that a human mortal sinner can speak for God, can tell God how he works. I want you to think about that. That's why this title makes sense. Any any religion that gets up, any theology that gets up, any man that gets up and tells us that they know that God has said a certain thing and my response is, show me in the Bible and they only can give me their opinions. They can only give me their thoughts. I don't care about your thoughts. I don't care about your opinions. I don't care about my opinions. I care what does the word of the Lord say. Let's go back to our Bible. You know this was going to happen. If y'all know me for any length of time, you know we got to go to the Bible. What did he say in Matthew 4? Let's go back there. What did he say in Matthew 4? For it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and the tempter verse three and the tempter said to him if you are the son of God if control the narrative if means he already knows what's going on but he needs you to prove it if you are the son of God he's questioning he's trying to get Christ to question or just answer in a way that if you answer on the narrative religion will come out of victor 99% of the time because you can't argue from a narrative that somebody else has already set up you you setting up to fail i'm telling you the devil is better skilled at dealing with you because remember he was the first to fall you came second and not only did you come second, you came with something that he hates. You have the, you were built and given something that he never has. That's a soul. You've been given something that the angels in heaven don't have. You've been given something that nothing on, nothing in this reality has. To the most evil, corrupt man or woman you know. To the mother or grandmother or wife that you love or husband that you love. You have a soul. You have something that will live and will outlive your flesh. That's amazing. But where it ends up is the consequence of thinking you have options. It's obedience or the consequence. God sets the tone. God sets the rules. God set the law. God set the sacrifice. God set the reconciliation. There's no negotiation in this. There's no reasoning on this. There's nothing else to add to it. There's nothing you can take away from it. God hasn't changed his mind. God has never changed. Nothing in God that God does is confusing. Nothing that God does creates division. It's either you are on his side or you're not. There is no gray area. There is no riding the fence. There is no and here's a here's there's a there's a middle ground that people try to take. A lot of reformed theologians will say this and or I hear a lot of young men and women will tell me, well, you know, you can have a secondary theology. Did Jesus have one? No. Did Paul have one? Well, no. Did Paul, because, you know, as most theologians and most religions will love, they love Paul. But they only love Paul only when they can take him out of context. Because if you keep Paul in context, the theology won't hold. How do we know that? Because listen to Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, that's where I'm at right now in the Bible study. Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same, I write to write the same things again. It's no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard to you. The word itself in the Greek is like asphalt. Let's look at the word asphalt, a foundation. It is a safety net. It is something foundationally strong that I send this epistle to you and that you read it, and it's no problem. Paul said, I'll write this as many times as it takes. It's no problem for me. It's just ink, it's just paper, and it's just a paraphrase running back and forth, delivered. It ain't no big deal. 
Epaphras don't mind. The runners of Christ don't mind. You, we don't. The mail service was happening right here. There's no issue with Paul saying, "I got no problem doing this because it's going to safeguard you." What? What against? Listen to this. Beware of the dogs. Jesus called the religious, the religious men, the Pharisees, those that like to teach man precepts, man uh, uh, traditions, man's philosophy. That's what man does. God called them dogs. Everyone loves their little dog. They love that cute little Pomeranian. They love their pit bull. The guy's great. You forget dogs are scavengers. They take enjoyment in rolling in dead things. They will vomit no matter what they ate, no matter how disgusting or, or impure or, or gross and vile smelling, they will go back and consume it again. That's dogs. Remember, scavengers. He's, that, that's the, he's telling you the lowest possible denomination of a person. Dogs. These that eat on carcasses. These that will prey on the weak. They see a sick dogs in the wild. When something is sick and they're hungry, they tear it down. Listen to this. Beware of the evil workers. Another phrase, another term called what? The religion, the people that are working against God. Evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. The Judaizers. Those in Judaism. It's all the same. You can put any of these in that camp. Beware of Protestantism. Beware of Roman Catholicism. Beware of Islam. Beware of Mormonism. Beware of man of people that love to manifest. Beware of psychics. Beware of which you can name it in there. If it's a human belief, it all falls under dogs and evil workers and the false circumcision. Because you can't you, you you can't proselyte into the Israelite people today. And think that's going to get you saved. It doesn't. I come a converted Jew. That holds no water and weight. You still got to come to the cross. You still have to take personal responsibility for your sin. And you still must repent. There's no options on that. You got to repent. Let's continue. For we, this is Paul now, we are the true circumcision. We're the true mark of what it is to be a Christian. That's a label that we've been given by the outside world. Now it's a badge anybody can stick on their label. Any Protestant religion, any Roman Catholic, anybody can say they can take that Christian sticker, put it right there, and just rape the Bible. I hate to be that, that brutal and savage about it, but that's pretty much what happens. You take a proof text, take it out of context, because in context, everything works. Out of context, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. Just take it, make it run. But listen to this. Here's Paul saying, look, if there's anybody that could trust religion and theology, it was me. Listen to Paul. For we are the, for we are the true work surgeon who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Now, we got to stop right there. There's a comma right there, but we got to stop right there because Paul is saying something here that's very important. Listen to what he said. For we worship in the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is powering our worship. Okay? He's powering and empowering our worship. And we're doing it in Him. We're doing it in Christ. Right? Powered by the Holy Spirit. We are worshiping in truth. And we are glorifying, we are glorying in Christ Jesus. Religion, its first glory is in the religion itself. Now, you're probably going to ask me, well, how do I know that to be true? How do I know that to be true? When you say, I know Roman Catholicism is false. I know Reformed theology is false. I know Islam is false. I know Mormonism is false. I know every self-belief system is false. I know witchcraft is false. I know, I know atheism is false. I know agnosticism is false. When you make those claims, what is the first thing that comes out of their mouth? Well, maybe the uh, let's go. I'll, I'll give two. Here's two the two possibilities. That's it. You're stupid. You're wrong. That's dumb. You must be saved. How ignorant. You're a fool. You're a heretic. That's the first is the insult. That's one possibility. But it's coming. It may not be the first, but it's in. It's coming. And the next one. Well, let me tell you why I believe in X. 
and why I know it's the true whatever. That's how it works. Notice they they assumed immediately that when I said that Roman Catholicism, Reformed theology, Protestant, all the religion is false, they went to defend it. But I never said that the Bible was false. I never said that Jesus was false. I never said that God was false. I never said anything of that nature. I said, this thing that you believe is false. This man-made thing that you trust is false. Your thoughts and opinions on God is false. Your belief that options are real is false. It's a, That's all I said. And it will immediately immediately 100% of the time people will go to emotional defense mode but I never attack God because that's what a stronghold is that's what a stronghold is see a stronghold is what the mental framework how and what you built your life on it's how you think. It's your belief structure. It's all that you have done to create this argument. And with and inside that argument is you. Okay? You've created this foundation, if you will, this stronghold, this ability to now defend what's on the inside of it and say that this is true. You have all the archers you need. You have all the knights that you need. And all of them are different arguments. Inside, there's a narrative that you will throw. That's the banner that you throw up. It's all of those things. And what does the word of the Lord say about strongholds? What do we know about strongholds? Well, you know, we know that strongholds are what? Let's go to the Bible. And let's go to strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I, Paul, myself appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Paul not appealing by what? He didn't say, I come to appeal to you by my sensibilities, my intellect. I didn't come to you with the, I came to you with what? I appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble among you in person, but bold toward you when absent, I beg you that when I am present, I will not need to be bold with confidence by which I plan to challenge certain people who think we are living according to the flesh. Here we go. We're supposed to be living to the according to religion. Belief structure. Paul's got to come and lay, 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 lay some wood down. But listen to this. Because we all know this is easy. This all comes from one of the most famous verses out there. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolish of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to what? To obey God. Christ, and we are ready to punish any disobedience once your obedience is complete. Did you notice options are being demolished? Religion is being demolished. That's what the Bible does. That's what God does. That's what we do when we make disciples. That's what the gospel does on its on its on its on its basis level. It does that to understand why we must obey, why we must repent. It teaches about who Jesus is, who God is, why Jesus died for our sins, why that faith in Jesus will get us saved, will spare us from hell, and why that Though the road is narrow that leads to righteousness, that road can still is still wide enough for one person at a time. There's nobody restricted. There's no restrictions. There's nobody telling you you can't repent. There's people are telling you don't have you have options. 
You can repent later in life. You can repent tomorrow. Just wait till tomorrow. You got things to do today. The devil loves to tell you, you got options, man. You know, if you just stick with this religion, God, you hear this all. God knows your heart. He just knows that you're just serving him. And that doesn't sound like God at all, because that's not in the Bible. Because here's Paul saying the very thing the Bible says. And we're ready to punish any disobedience. He just said, well, we're, well, since you were in that other thinking, it's okay. You know, we'll we, we'll let you back. No, because what is it supposed to do? What is the knowledge of God to do? The knowledge of God, we take caught every take, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Obey, obey. Notice, not options. Obey. There is no option. There is obedience. And then there's the punishment of disobedience. Cause and reaction. That's it. That's all you got. Religion has always tried to speak for God. And here's God telling them, you know what? There's some people in here trying to say we're living according to the... We, there are people out there in this world that are thinking. And God bless them. I, I, I weep for them. They really believe that somehow their belief structure helps them. There is, there, there is no belief structure that a man has that can help him. It's either by faith or nothing. You either believe Christ totally and rely on nothing else or everything else is on your, on your shoulders and you will go to hell just as fast as everyone else was that, rep that didn't repent and thought that their way to get to God is through this said religion, this said thinking pattern. When Christ died on that cross, and let's be honest, he wasn't killed. Christ laid his life down and he picked it right back up. Just as John 10 said, God says, he, that's exactly what the Lord says. I challenge you, go read John 10, beautiful. Talks about religion again. Talks about how men will try to come in and steal the sheep. You got to remember, the whole point of religion is to replace the truth of God. It's to try to superimpose their thinking with God. Judaism has been trying it since the golden calf. It's been introduced since Genesis, but it's been going on since the golden calf, and it's been going on ever since. Humanity has a way to take something of God and pervert it. That's why obedience is the only way to God. That's it. Obey Christ. Obey God. That is it. There is no room for nothing else. Anybody in any theology, in any religion, in any belief structure, doesn't matter if it's Christian related or not. All you do have to ask them is, what does the Bible say about that? Show me in the Bible that what you're believing is true. And they will go out of their way to not go to it. You want to know why? Because they know it's a lie. Their stronghold is why they feel so strong about it. To where they feel so strong about it that if they even dare go to the Bible... They have to take it out of context in order to make it work. Can you imagine the kind of evildoer that takes? Can you imagine what kind of compromised soul that takes? Can you imagine a person that's so desperate to want to be righteous, to want to believe that Christ Jesus is the only way that much like Judas, they didn't trust what was being was in front of them. So they went another route. And let me tell you, all of us has been there. There is a there is a small few that is in every religion. There is a small few, and I mean a minuscule amount, that truly, truly know what they're doing is wrong. But they're too afraid to do anything different. The rest is the mob. Religion is the highest form of mob rules. Let me tell you something. Call any religion out as false and the second thing will happen, I told you, or the first thing will happen, you're going to get insulted. It's just going to happen because you're attacking a stronghold 
and you're attacking it with something that they are fully aware of, but they have no interest in talking about it. They don't want to deal with it. You see, the whole point of options is if you can believe that you have options, then there is no punishment to the disobedience. Because you can always say, well, God knows my heart. I know I, you know, I can't find it in the Bible. I can't back it up in the Bible, but I believe it's true. So does everybody in religion or lack thereof believe that they're, that they're right. But you see, we, I close out with this. But see, you can't lie about God. And you can't lie about God, especially in his Bible. Because when it's called out, you got to run from it. It's the only way to do it. I, that, that's, that is my secret weapon, and it ain't even secret. You want to have a belief structure? Show me in the Bible, in context, where it is. Watch personal opinions rain down. Watch. Don't, don't take my word for it. Do it yourself. You'll see. So listen to this. God, this is Romans 1. This tells, here's the faith summed up. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For it is it in it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. If there was ever a time for God to confirm religion, it would have been here, and he didn't. Never has. Because here's what every religious man or lack thereof know. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. All religion has to suppress the truth. Atheism has gone out of its way to try. If it's not by faith, then it is by suppression of the truth is what you're going to be working against. It's just that simple. Guys, you got to understand. God knows it is scary to just just let go of everything man made that talks about God and just have faith alone. It's scary. It's frightening. It is. I get it. Joshua got it. You want to go to Joshua 1? What does he say? Don't look. Have good courage. He knows it's going to be tough. He knows it's going to be rough. He knows you're going to get attacked. He knows the mob is going to come for you. He knows that you will be called names. He knows that your friends will turn against you. Your family will turn against you. You'll get out of your church. Your church will turn their back on you. You'll be ridiculed. You'll be called every name in the book. And Christ was called them all. There ain't no mocking that you'll receive that Christ didn't receive tenfold. But when you stand on him alone, nothing else, nothing else contrived by human hands, you will have a freedom. You will know obedience and you will know a peace and war uh, that you will never have ever experienced in your life. You will have a foundation that you can know, not feel, but you will know is immovable. And let me tell you something, when you live in that space, when you live in the shadow of the of the cross, when you are in, when when you are relying God to be the mountain, your refuge, you will know true persecution. The one the Bible talks about because You'll be the guy that other religions are saying that heathen, that heretic, he's no good. They'll be agreeing with their own enemies. All the houses of Satan, which is your religions, your belief structures, all those things that exalt itself, all those strongholds will aim all their weapons toward you. Because you're not standing with the crowd anymore, are you? No, uh-uh. You're standing with God. And with God means there's no other room for anything else. So the conversation, they can't spin a narrative to you no more, guys. There's no narrative anymore. There's no way they can spin you. There's no way they can trap you. There's no way they can get around the truth of God. They can't. 
The only thing that's left is attack and persecution. That's it. If you're in a religion today, if you're in a belief structure today, you are not being persecuted. By God's sake, I guarantee you're not. Let me tell you how beautiful the truth is. And let me tell you how it reacts. Atheists, agnostics, those that don't believe when they attack and say, you know, religion sucks. That's aimed at the religion. You haven't talked about God at all. Because, see, humanity knows a lie when they hear it. And every time you try to peddle religion to a person, they know it's a lie and they're going to they're going to stand against it. And they're going to bring their own stronghold. But when it comes to God, when it comes to the Bible, and you stand on just that, the conversation is very different. You will notice, and I'll close with this, you will notice this truth. This is, again, facts. When you just bring the Bible, the accusations that now get levied against you or what's going to be said against you is going to sound like this. Okay? Oh, you're just like every other religion. Oh, uh, you know, I was raised in the church too. Yeah, I was raised this and I was raised that. I heard it all before. I read the Bible for 10 years. I, 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 was, the, I was in the choir. Everything but hearing what you ask. What does the Bible say? That's the stronghold. Whatever comes out of their mouth is the stronghold. Because if they cannot define it with the Bible in context, they live in a lie. That's what we do. We take down strongholds. There are no greater strongholds on this earth than sinful human belief. It is so dangerous because it tries to exalt itself against God. And the latest and greatest way to do it is by trying to superimpose its beliefs over the Bible. Reformed theology cannot believe in God without it first believing in Reformed theology and then the Bible. Same thing with Roman Catholicism. They cannot believe in God till they believe in Roman Catholicism first and then the Bible. You name the belief structure, it has to be believed first before the Bible can be trusted. That's how it works. When you believe in God and God alone and you trust what his word says, then you can take on that nice catchphrase, I'm a Berean. Then you can say that. Because Bereans heard what they had to say and searched the scriptures to see that they're true. I love you very much, guys. Should be a week to remember, like every week is. Go out, serve the Lord, abandon the religions Stick with God, and if you're scared, good. That's a good place to be because God will give you power and strength in the Holy Spirit. Trust in Jesus and him alone. And if you don't know Christ, I promise you, as God is my witness, there is a true believer. My brother and sister is not that far from you. And I guarantee he's not in a religion, and she's not either. I love you very much. See me every Wednesday. Uh, I'll probably be migrating to Instagram on Wednesdays for my Bible studies. We're in Philippians right now. It's on my podcast. I said I'd plug it at the end. It's on my podcast. It's on my YouTube channel. I don't even try to grow my YouTube channel. It's, no, it's, my YouTube channel is just, it's just a deposit where I send my stuff because that's just what I do. It's just a backup system. And I don't use it for anything else, but if you want to see videos of it, absolutely it's there. But my podcast is where, that's where all of my love goes into because it's just, I love it. It's, I just, I've been with them for a while. Our Heart Radio has been such a massive uh, supporter. I don't even know why they still do what they do, but I love it. Uh, I want to thank everybody who prays for this ministry that helped this ministry stay go, straight, go forward. And I love all of my brothers and sisters in Christ, those that tune in, those that truly love God. And, and as Christ said, those that my brothers and brothers are those that love Christ and serve God. And, and I just you guys do not understand how much I love you, because if y'all talk to me daily, you know that 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 bond and friendship, that that fellowship, that family bond is stronger to me than blood. You are my true brothers and sisters in Christ. I love you. You are not alone. And remember to stand with God because with God, you cannot be moved. I love you so much, guys. I'll see you soon. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD. 
your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.